Okay, so I'm John Baker. I work at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I don't get out much now, but <laughs> um, so this is my title: uh, Overview of Black Hole Mergers in Numerical Relativity Simulations. But I want to try to, uh, you know, hopefully make it relevant in some places here. So it's not really just going to focus on numerical relativity simulations. But in my shadow title, which is what I'm always thinking about anyway. What is the role of space-based gravitational wave astronomy overall? So, so you can be thinking about that question um, while listening to everything else. And just to be clear, here is some uh, some of the. This is a, a figure from Jeremy Schnittman. Some of the uh, types of signals from black hole mergers that have been considered, <coughs> or looked for, or seen. And um, I am not considering all of this. Just considering this right here, which is the idea of we're trying to see black hole mergers at at the at the peak moment when they're happening, the in the scale of you know no longer than one year, and possibly even much shorter than that. So, but there could be electromagnetic and gravitational wave signatures in there. So I'm going to consider both possibilities. Um, and so here's my, my, my master slide with a bunch of questions on it here. Um, two potential avenues for trying to observe these things would be gravitational waves and electromagnetic uh, observations, which uh, we certainly expect that they're generating gravitational waves. We don't really know whether they're generating um, any kind of observable EM signatures. Uh, and we know how to simulate gravitational waves uh, from these in, in a lot of detail, which is what I'll probably spend the biggest part of the talk talking on. Um, but so we have a, a lot of uh, large-scale questions. It says, what kind of information do the gravitational waves carry about the system? What details can you learn about? What, what kind of gravitational wave, what kind of information in the gravitational waves in general? What kind of details can you learn about the binaries? Uh, so I think a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about, there's surely somebody that knows more than I do about it. And there's a lot of stuff that maybe everybody knows. But so I'm just putting it in here anyway, because maybe there's somebody that doesn't know something about any of these topics. So, Or for any topic, there may be someone that doesn't know about it. Let's put it that way. Um, so uh, the bigger questions are, what does this tell? What can we learn from these about? the broad, broader astrophysical processes that we'd really like to learn about rather than just you know that individual system. Um, how do these gravitational waves fit into the broader enterprise of astronomy? Something I'm always wondering about and something that I'd like to talk about here. And maybe we have some splinter groups about the, you know, what, what do we learn about astronomy from gravitational waves? Um, and then, you know, out of this, you have questions about what kind of instrument you need for this. So you have Questions about electromagnetic observations. Are there mechanisms that can power an electromagnetic signal? Um, what information might be in these? Could these signals be rec distinguished from the diverse phenomena of the sky? And what kind of instruments would be good for that? And getting answers to these kind of things, some of these kind of things, you know, maybe all of these depend on some numerical simulations that have ideas of what to expect. Uh, so gravitational waves from black hole, massive black hole mergers, uh, summary slide here, basic slide. Um, you get gravitational waves when you have rapid changes or motion of massive objects. Probably everybody does know that by now here. The gravitational waves, we measure them as tidal accelerations of objects, relative motion of, of two objects. And so this is a, a little figure of how a you know, circle of objects would respond to gravitational waves. Um, not going to talk about the observation problem. Um, but if you sort of generally think about, so we have the general properties of a black hole merger, a huge amount of energy is released in a really short period of time. So uh, the amount of energy is some, is there, does somebody have like a pointer? I'll just point here. Oh, great. Um, some fraction of the total rest mass of the black hole is released, the total mass of the black hole is released in in a matter of a short period of time. So this might be a few percent. So the typical numerical simulation for comparable mass binaries, it's a couple to 10% or something, depending. Why is it so efficient? Why is it so efficient? Well, it's, um, it's, this is a purely gravitational uh, process, right? So um, it's the black holes. Uh, you know, this is 
what, what do you say? It's, it, it's an extremely violent interaction by the time you get two black holes spiraling into each other. And that motion is, is coupled to, you know, in GR, the motion is coupled to radiation, and that's just how much radiation. These black holes are moving at a significant fraction of the speed of light by the time they emerge. So there's, a, there's just a great deal of uh, energy released. So you can compare, you know, the few percent of, of the mass is released in a short period of time, and that's kind of like your few percent of the mass was released, a few percent of the accreted materials mass forming the black hole was released in electromagnetic radiation over time too. So, you know, it's probably less, but a comparable amount in, in one merger quickly. So the time scale for this, now you can try to be more quantitative than I have. Maybe that'd be a good thing to do. Uh, but you know, it's on the order of, uh, several hundred to several thousand seconds for a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. So, depending on how you define your time scale. Um, and then you can, at, at the peak, the, the luminosity, the total energy per second, is probably the greatest luminosity of anything, any astronomical event, up to on the order of 10 to the 56 Earths per second. 10 to the 23 solar luminosities, and thereby more energy than all of the stars and all of the galaxies. It's pretty short, depending on the mass of the uh, um, system. It, you know, for 10 to the 6 solar masses, this is this is minutes. Okay, that's your 500 to 5,000. Right. So this is really just the peak part. It's, it's a pretty sharp peak. Um, so, and then special things about gravitational radiation, observa uh, you know, as, as an astronomical messenger, is we measure amplitude and not power. And also, sources like black hole mergers are monolithically coherent, meaning all the, all the gravitational waves come out in phase. So that means that the sensitivity falls off like one over the distance rather than one over the distance squared. Um, I can't think of anything else that would actually work like that. I, um, the, um, but there are, would be other gravitational wave sources, stochastic sources, where you don't have this property. It's not coherent anymore, and so it's, it's more familiar like one over d squared. Um, then you add to that that the sources are rare, and it's not too surprising that you know, your sort of entry-level instrument can see black hole mergers through the whole um, another thing about the black hole mergers, because the gravitational waves are weakly coupled to everything, they propagate cleanly without any kind of, of uh, dispersion effects or obscuration being really uh, likely. There is weak gravitational lensing. Um, and you get information about masses and spins of black holes that can be quite precise. You also get, I was going to add on there, you get information about you know, the distance and the sky position and stuff as well, but that's, that's not as precise. In fact, pretty horrible in terms of sky position by, by a lot of standards. So we'd like to answer big questions like how do the first massive black holes assemble and how do their masses and spins evolve over time and what's the relationship between black holes and their galaxies and what can we understand about the nature of black holes themselves and the nature of strong gravitational physics. Um, these are big questions. We should talk about them a lot. Not so much something I get to say a lot about here, uh, though. Um, Hopefully at the end, maybe we can return to these questions. Um, but we do need, in order to, so there's also other things that, uh, um, other than uh, making gravitational wave observations, we can also learn from numerical simulations about uh, uh, kicks and things like kicks and the structure, the formation uh, properties of merged black holes as, and also uh, you know, the potential for electromagnetic signatures. So here's a waveform. Um, a simulated LISA observation from the original LISA, and it's got some noise, uh, you know, instrumental noise um, and uh, foreground astrophysical noise in there. It can be pretty clear. Um, this is two 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes that are registered to 5. Um, but so there's a long in spiral approach, but then this is the part of the signal that, that you would use numerical relativity for. just just at the end, and this is on the order of a few thousand seconds here. Um, you can see the peak part right here, Rich, is, is just well under a thousand seconds. Um, and the, so we can also look at this. Uh, so, so this is the part, you're getting this signal, we didn't always know exactly what these signals look like, and it was a mystery until about 
a little less than 10 years ago when we first started being able to do the calculations. <laughs> Sorry? Um, that is the strain in... I don't even remember exactly what the units are on this, so... It's the the, so the so the strain. If you, if you want, it, the strain is yeah. If if it's strain in the usual sense, then it's it's the amount of displacement of your little test um, particles in your detector per unit length. So that that's what strain means. Sorry, that, I answered the wrong question, but uh, um, the yeah. Uh, so this is a similar thing. This is, again, old LISA, but this is in the frequency domain. So uh, there's signal over a long period of time. These triangles represent where you are sort of up to one month. And so the signal can be observable for a year. There can be a significant amount of power well in advance of, of, of the merger. But this, this you know, numerical simulation part is really where a lot of the power is for, for many of the sources, unless it's a really high mass running off the edge of the, of the, of the sensitivity window. Um, all right, so in order to do that, we need to understand general relativity. So this is my slide that I include in my middle school presentations. It's general relativity in one minute. Um, you know, special relativity, we took the concept of space and time and invented space time um, in order to, to see how the speed of light can be constant. In general relativity, um, we add that space-time can be curved and that this replaces the concept of the gravitational field and the space-time is now dynamic and mass and energy cause space-time to be curved and particles and light follow paths on curved space-time and gravitational waves and black holes require no matter, they're pure gravity, so it's very easy. And this is the mathematical version. Um, there's a quantity called the metric that tells you information about distances between points. Uh, I know this is very uh, introductory. Um, and then in order to, to do calculations, we need to take derivatives. This is really a gauge quantity, but to get something more physical, we take derivatives of that and get a curvature tensor. Um, and the curvature tensor is, parts of the curvature tensor are what go into the um, Einstein field equations and give us the that a part called the Einstein tensor. And for gravitational waves and matter, um, you know, the left-hand side of Einstein's equation, which is the stress-energy tensor from the matter, um, is just zero because there is no matter. So it's a really simple set of equations, which will show up in a minute, just g equals zero. So you say, well, that's pretty easy to solve. And it is, as long as you're comfortable with just getting flat space-time as your solution. But if you want it to be interesting, you have to do some work. So here's a, a, just a quick, rough uh, sketch of kind of how this works. We take space-time and go back and cut into slices of space that are stacked together through time. And so, you know, for a simulation, you then put some initial uh, setup on one slice, and you have some equations that tell you how the, you know, there's, this turns out to be a Cauchy problem, so that you, if you have one slice set up, you can predict what the next slice will be from Einstein's equations. Uh, that's a subset of Einstein's equations. There's additional portion of Einstein's equations. Einstein's got 10 equations here. So you, there's you know, some, some for evolving, and the others are constraints. And so your initial data has to satisfy some constraints, and then you evolve uh, consistently, and the constraints will remain satisfied. So at the end of the day, for practical um, uh, evolutions, we end up with uh, 10 to 20 fields that were sort of evolving related to gravitational um, information in a set of partial differential equations. So, um, so this is there's a long history to trying to do this, you know, starting back in the 60s, um, and then there was, um, the, you know, the first real attempts to do this in 3D, kind of in the early 90s, and it was really hard. And then eventually, it was suddenly very easy around 2005, and and a couple different approaches started started, uh, you know, just working really well. And a lot of stuff has happened since then. Um, and that's mainly I'm sorry. There, there's, we've sort of crystallized into two main approaches. So there's um, most of the groups are working on this sort of moving puncture formulation, and these typically uh, these use um, one particular formulation of the equations, and they use uh, finite difference numerical techniques. They're using most of these are now using Cactus, uh, the computational framework. 
um, and this, which includes uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, the other approach is, this, is uses a different formulation equations, which can work with uh, uh, a spectral uh, formulation of the uh, spatial derivatives. For, for handling the spatial derivatives. And they have, uh, there's just one group really, one multi-institution group of Caltech, Cornell, and CETA that are doing this. They, they get very active. This, this approach gives you, you know, very accurate um, simulations. It's great for the long, um, long waveform studies. Um, but it's a, little, it's a little more work to do it. So you know, a larger number of simulations are done here, um, and these have tended to focus more on what happens in just the final moments, which is really good for understanding things like kicks and what the final spin is and what the basic behavior of black holes is like. This one is this basic stuff. And this one is really focused on getting the really long waveforms themselves. And they all agree when tested? They agree, yeah, when tested against each other with appropriate uh, you know, qualifications for how we expect them to be. There, there are subtleties that remain in terms of how you define radiation once you get down to really fine levels of precision. Um, uh, but there's a whole lot of questions that, uh, that, are, that are more urgent now than There aren't really, really any great, terrible subtleties. It's, 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 it's pretty, uh, you get pretty consistent results where you need to. The, 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 the biggest subtleties perhaps are related to um, the fact that there's still some gauge dependence and you need to be careful about how you define the radiation. You're trying to extract it sort of far away from the black holes. Um, but how far away is far enough? And so we sort of do extrapolation, trying to make sure that there's no dependence on extraction radius. But the simulations, anyway, let's, let's avoid these details, because I have a whole lot of slides. You end up with lovely movies like this at the end of the day, actually, if, if, you, if you hire somebody to make a lovely movie or go do some you know, work with a visualization uh, package. Uh, so you see black holes merging around each other. There's a structure of gravitational field around them. Uh, which is you know the, the metric and all the curvature quantities and you know, at the end of the day you end up with uh, some gravitational radiation coming out and you can quantify uh, what your waveform signal predictions will look like and do all kinds of other interesting stuff. So here's my map slide on on the, the kind of stuff that vacuum black binary black hole numeric relativity studies are applied to. Uh, by the way, I need to have a clock going so I have some idea of how much time I'm taking. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, I've sort of set together a, a couple categories. A number of different type of uh, phenomena are studied, and I mentioned that the, one of the two categories of uh, approaches to the simulations has been used for a lot of this. You know, stuff that we've been interested in, uh, just figuring out how much energy comes out, what the final spin of the black hole that's formed from a merger is, looking at how uh, mergers at different mass ratio compare with each other, looking at um, the effect of spins, the, the, the prim first primary effect being that you get this spin orbit coupling effect which can extend the merger for uh, aligned spins. Um, the, the next effect is precession, which can create some complicated dynamics, which are really interesting and also lead to structure in the waveforms, which is great for trying to get information out about the system. Um, and then uh, probably everybody knows that if there's asymmetry in the system, then more gravitational radiation goes out in one direction than another, and you get a kick, and so there's work on quantifying that. And there's less been done on you know, what happens if we, we uh, have an eccentric uh, set of mergers. I should comment um, just in terms of uh, what the parameter space of merger simulations is like. Generally speaking, if you uh, let's see a white piece of chalk would be good. If you have uh, two black holes, then for each black hole, so here's a black hole, and it's got a mass and it's got a spin vector, which is three degrees of freedom, and it's got a momentum vector, which is three degrees freedom, and it's got a position. So that's 10 uh, parameters to describe one black hole. And if I have two, then I have 20 parameters. So, But three of those we can't measure with the gravitational wave observation, and we always sort of forget about. Those are a source of the, the center of mass momentum you can't measure. The, the, the line of sight motion, um, 
has an impact on the signal, but it's entirely degenerate with the redshift. So we can't measure it separately. And then the motion across the sky is too tiny to ever have any observable impact. So the rest of them, 17 parameters, are the ones that we have to fit if we're really doing a gravitational wave observation. So, but when you're doing a simulation, um, it's really just we don't care about the position and orientation of the system and all, all of that. So, so at the end of the day, there's only nine of the parameters. Uh, also, the mass of of the, we, we get, a, we get a, a free mass for our simulations because we can just rescale time and space with the mass. And so at the end of the day, then there are nine parameters for simulation. And two of those I'll mention are eccentricity and are usually, uh, we assume we start with, with low eccentricity, though, though we now have some general understanding that it's possible that there would be detectable levels of eccentricity at the, at the point of getting gravitational waves. So, um, just a little aside. Um, so on this part of the phenomenology, um, I mentioned that we you know, have taken an interest in what happens when you have uh, different, uh, different masses of mergers. These are all non-spinning mergers. Um, and so g generally speaking, the end of the merger, um, you, you, once you get to the ISCO, it, it, uh, up to the, the, there's a there's a, a great deal of general similarity about in spirals uh, up to the up to the point of ISCO and and you get a, a, a kind of dis decent picture of what the waveforms are like up to that point from the post Newtonian models which are the, the analytic models for for these it's not a, exactly correct in the last few orbits but um, it gives you the right idea but then at merger the post Newtonian models don't have anything to tell you anymore if the mass ratio is small enough or large enough, depending on which way you like to look at it, then then um, then the signal is small after merger. But for anything in the order of 10 to 1, um, there, there's still quite a lot of power in the merger, and it's very very merger dominated. Why are the length the length field different from the different mass ratio? The length of these signals, yeah. because people have simulated for a longer time with the Q equal one equal mass simulation than they have with with uh, with it's just you, know, so you arbitrarily choose when you start the simulation essentially you start with some separation so the starting point is kind of meaningless uh, but that's you know it's a subtlety when you want to actually compare things because you've got this sort of everything depends on your meaningless starting point when you when you actually want to compare it uh, so you know there are extremes of this like this hundred to one mass ratio which has been tackled numerically uh, as well so you can you can you can go you can go out of the box a little but you have to do Force effort. So here's a very old slide on the effect of, of uh, aligned spins in, in a merger. So if you have spins that are aligned, then the the there's a, a lot of extra angular, some extra angular momentum, and you have to kind of get rid of some of that angular. So the sort of qualitative picture, you have to get rid of that angular momentum before you merge. If you just sort of you, if you know you have to do a little bit of that just so you don't, you don't end up with uh, uh, a, a naked singularity at the end of the day. You, can, you, only, have, you only squeeze so much angular momentum into the final black hole. Um, so you can also just understand this as, as just the natural way that spins and spins and uh, orbit angular momentum couple in the in the in the energetics of uh, of gravity. Um, but so the effect is that you get you get sort of more slowly developing but still strong signals from uh, from aligned spins positively aligned spins, and that gives you the brightest, the, the most energy comes out of those simulations. And then you end up with kind of a lot of cycles um, at, at, through the merger. And the opposite is when you have the, the two spins aligned with each other, but anti-aligned with the orbital angular momentum. And then you, know, you have a sort of uh, abrupt merger with few cycles in it. Um, so the if the spins are not exactly aligned or anti-aligned, then they can process. And so here's an example where um, you have the two black holes merging together with their spin vectors processing around a little bit, though in this case, um, the orbital plane is, it's, it's rigged up with enough symmetry so that the orbital plane is not uh, processing in that case, but that is also a possibility. So, and here's some recent um, simulations uh, that show some more uh, more interesting signals of, of precession. This is um, so the angular momentum vector, total angular momentum as a as a function of time. I think was yellow here, 
And these are the individual spin direction vectors. And here's just some trajectories for showing you sort of orbital plane uh, motion. And I, if you have precession going on, then it leaves an imprint in the waveforms that come out. And those imprints are, prints are very rich. And so if, you, if all black hole mergers were non-processing, the waveforms would be more degenerate and it'd be harder to pick out the parameters. So the fact that precession is a, is a phenomenon helps us when we want to go back and, and figure out what happened. Um, so kicks. And then we've put the, I've, I've titled this spin kicks. I did that a long time ago when it was part of a set of slides. But um, <clears throat> we originally looked for we expected kicks. We, kicks come when the, the gravitational radiation coming out is, is not going out uh, equally in all directions. So the gravitational wave, you know, roughly speaking, gravitational waves carry momentum. And so if they're not carrying the same amount of momentum in opposite directions, then you end up with a net momentum. Um, and, if, and depending on, so you know, approaching the merger, that's kind of, there, there's a, a, a little bit of thrust that's sort of circling around in which direction it's going. But as you get to the merger, the thrust is growing and then suddenly shuts off. And depending on exactly how that happens, you get a kick. And um, they can be quite sizable. So actually, we, we thought they're kind of negligible because they're just like 0.0001 or something because we use units where C is 1. But they turns out to be kind of large in kilometers per second, say. So. Um, so, you know, the, but it turned out that the effects, so we, we, we could obviously see there's going to be asymmetry when you have unequal masses. Um, that seemed like it should be the big deal. And so the first studies were, were, were in that direction. And you see kind of that there was no, uh, no, uh, no kick larger than uh, 200, less than 200 uh, kilometers per second, no matter how you, how you figure that, if, if you had optimal sort of mass ratio difference. And so uh, initially, it's kind of like, well, this isn't as interesting as we hoped. Um, but then um, kind of a whole bunch of groups discovered more or less simultaneously that when you put spins in the problem, um, you actually have potential for, for much larger asymmetries in the radiation and, and bigger kicks. And so here's a recent, a relatively recent, um, um, uh, one of the groups that's done the best work on this is, is the, the RIT group. And this is uh, uh, a plot including, in the, if it fits for exactly what kind of kicks you get out. I know some people in the room have used these fits in various papers. Uh, but um, now kicks can, can uh, believe to be possible up to about 5,000 kilometers per second, depending on the configuration. And so, and, and now the, and the, and the maximum kick is with sort of partially, a little bit almost aligned spin directions, but still not, not too collinear. So it's not a function of Q it is a function of Q, and th so there's a coefficient on the spin kicks that's, that depends on Q. Uh, but the direct, so there's sort of an additive effect, roughly speaking, of the kick you get from the spin asymmetry and the kick that you get from the, from the mass asymmetry. And the mass asymmetry part is, is not so interesting as the spin asymmetry part. So for the same numerical, say, same choice of the spins, the different numerical codes give the same answer. Um, there have been few real comparative studies there, um, so it's a good question. It's a hard, it's a little bit challenging. We, this, so, so one thing I should mention, right? So this is the, this this formula is for the maximum kick you get with this. So there, there's there's an, in the in the in the spin parameter space. I meant out of here these nine parameters. Two are eccentricity. One is mass ratio, and the rest are spin. So there's a whole bunch of parameters that go into this, right? And um, the the kick depends on the exact relative orientation of the spins at the time of merger. So there's sort of a couple degrees of freedom where you can really, and and that's just that's a sort of mixing process all the way through. So there's really no way to predict exactly how the spins are going to be aligned at the final moments of merger. So there's a, there's some really unknown degrees freedom that you just have to say, well, they're random because it depends on, you know, it, if you change the initial separation by, you know, a, a, a meter or something a million years before, it'd be a totally different problem, right? So um, the, the uh, but, but you can ask the question, if I then align those spins so at the point of merger, 
um, in those in those random degrees of freedom in a sort of optimal way, what's the maximum kick I could get? And then you just sort of get a, a sinusoidal cycle depending on what the what the orientation is that's sort of randomized. Um, so um, it makes it hard to do a real comparative simulation because there's these really fine details that depend, but basically you have to do a whole set of simulations where you kind of fit the peak and then you could compare those, but uh, uh, we haven't really done that. But John, so sorry, before you go on. You can, um, yeah. It's. To, I mean, it doesn't know what you want to say about spin alignment prior to merger, but compared to the 4,000 volume second from the in plane. It's still a special case. It was a special case before in plane, um, but it's. I mean, it's. A, it's a. It's a. It's a course. You can kind of see here. This is. This is the. You know, whether you're in plane or not. This is. So, you you went from being this red dashed curve here being the sort of old one where you're in plane to this one where you're where you're at uh, pi over four. So it's it's 45 degrees, right? So so it it's it's not close to aligned sure. like you might expect in a wet merger. But, and you see there's a sh precipitous drop, but it's a, it's a possibility. It's still going to be a special case because there's a number of different directions in which you had to line things up in order to get this. Um, all right, so merger waveforms. Uh, so I mentioned through all this that there's structure that gets imprinted in the waveforms, and that's what we're going to look for when we're trying to do gravitational wave observation. And so here's just uh, some examples. This is an equal mass non-spinning, our classic uh, starting place. Um, and then if you change the mass ratio, um, you have um, the effect that there are more multipolar components that contribute to the radiation, and so it gives it more structure. Um, and you know, if you if you want, this is these are. Uh, different examples of, of waveforms with the different multipolar components showing you this is the power in the different multipolar components a function of time. So um, the, the multipoles become much more important when you're in the merger than they are in the in spiral. And if you have um, unequal masses, then you have a rich structure of multipoles in the, fi in the figure. If you have equal masses um, uh, and non-spinning, you know, and then you get some situations. If you have spinning, aligned or aligned, you get different, different kinds of combinations. So, uh, all of this information um, gets imprinted in the signature of the, of the waveform. So, the, the the multipolar components, of course, then it, if if it's not just for, for the equal mass non-spinning case, really, um, it's so dominated by the 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 two two. Uh, it's so symmetric that if you look at it from any direction, it's and if you're just looking at it with one degree of freedom. It's, it's going to look kind of similar, um, but when you have uh, sort of competing modes that are kind of different frequencies, you get these more rich structures that you would see in your data in your, in your detector. Um, and then you get different patterns in the phasing when you change the spins. You can also get precession, um, which uh, I showed you a couple of examples before of precessing waveforms, but I didn't mention them. Here, here's just a recent um, summary of, of the Caltech Cornell's uh, uh, waveforms uh, that, that this is just a snapshot of their 170 waveforms that they have. So this is, you know, there's a whole lot of work to be done to really cover parameter space with waveform cases. You can see some of these have some more interesting precession based features in them that are more complicated and others um, are, are at least at this eye level kind of bland looking but there's a whole lot of this work going on. Um, optimally aligned before merging. Fish. <laughs> it, th this one, there's probably a, a considerable precession effect in the orbital plane at uh, approaching the merger, but they're shorter. Yeah. Well, some of them they just they just made them short, right? That just means they started close. Oh, this one right there? Yeah, that one. That one I think that one kind of does a does a an almost inversion of the orbital plane. That's pretty unusual. They, they they I think that's the one they highlighted in their discussion in this paper, but I'm not going to highlight it. I just show you the picture. 
Um, there's too much to talk about. So, so it, there's too much to do if you tried to, you can't numerically simulate every possibility and then do data analysis for searching for gravitational waves. This is, this is years and years of work by, you know, the, the only group that can do really long simulations, say, so, or, you know, really long, really accurate simulations. The, the, um, so there are analytic models, just like there are with the kicks, analytic models trying to fit the structure of the waveforms. Including the ring downs and the, and the mergers, and so uh, one of these is a effective one-body uh, waveform family, which agrees with post-Newtonian's design to be post-Newtonian early on, but then um, approach a, a, a ring down uh, at the end with uh, with some some of quasi-normal modes uh, structuring that. And there are also phenomenological models where you add a post-Newtonian waveform with the numerical and get a long one, and then you fit this with some uh, uh, just functional form that that resembles these waveforms, and usually in the frequency domain. Um, so, this is a result of a, of a recent, you know, community-wide uh, study involving lots of people doing lots of numerical simulations and and taking some of these models and comparing them and seeing how how for this is for LIGO possible LIGO observations, what the level of disagreement with the analytical models you get for the uh, family of particular for some particular waveforms. Um, so this is still, for LIGO, this kind of stuff is probably useful and you can get a lot of good information out of it. Um, for something where you have really high signal-to-noise ratios like you can get with LISA, this is, this is going to be really, really a difficult problem to, to ever have the end. You know, it's take a long time to have accurate enough models to fit all the way from possibilities. So let me just take a second here and mention some frontiers. Uh, where, where numerical simulations of black hole mergers are going. I showed you the, uh, the waveform from the 100 to 1 mass ratio uh, simulation of uh, RIT. Uh, uh, but here's the, here's the movie they made. Did you, I don't know, did you guys see the little black hole going around? Yeah. It's a little tiny dot. And here's another RIT. Um, that they really like doing these, uh, these exotic, um, um, fantastic, cool stuff. Um, so this is this is a, a separation in a recent paper of uh, Lou Stone's of uh, approximately 50m initial separation. So this goes around a little over two orbits, and you can see there's a, a zoom in where you see the, the separate orbit. So it's 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 a it's a it takes a lot of brute force numerical effort to do these because the time scale of of the of the simulation is, is ultimately tied to the light crossing time of the smallest black hole you have in the problem. Now you use adaptive mesh refinement to try to recover from this as much as you can. Um, but when you have the black hole moving very slowly around uh, through many, 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 many of those light crossing distances, it's a, it's a very large numerical problem to handle. <coughs> Just, what are we looking at the input I'm sorry. This is this is this is a trajectory of this is a, it's not really trajectory. It's a separation vector evolving over time, and then this is just a zoom in, you know, right up here, so you can see the the three. There's really three tracks that goes around. Oh, little times, yeah. Um, okay, so that was a whole bunch of numerical results, and uh, we see about what we can learn about uh, black hole mergers and what goes into signals. And then I mentioned we have the bigger question of what can we learn about broad or astrophysical processes. And we, we don't know as much about this. We haven't thought about it as much. And here is a, a beautiful plot, which I think is Alberto's uh, with some, some very love, with some, uh, a team of uh, graphics professionals. Uh, and um, so, so this is for ELISA. And these contours here show, so this is, this, uh, on this axis is the, the, the mass. Uh, this is equal mass non-spinning mergers. This is a, the mass of the, the system, or maybe that was a black hole. And this is the redshift. And then this is the SNR by which you would detect them with ELISA. So if they're, you know, the, the right mass in a redshift of two, it could be an SNR of a thousand. Um, more likely, their smaller mass and 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 redshift of or five or something. Of course, we don't really know, as Rich was pointing out. If if it if it you know we, yesterday's morning coffee was talk of three giga years to to get through the final parsec or whatever. If it really takes that long, then you know we can't really equivocate between this. Yes. So, these uh, these uh, the noise are taken from some um, models that I developed. Yeah. And the time scales for merger 
Alright, so we start from when the two gamers see each other and then we wait the moment of the two men to get the I thank you. Um, and I, I didn't mean to to belittle. Yeah, these are these are. Re, uh, I didn't say what the tracks are yet, but um, if, if you look at these time scales, they include the. DVD. But we don't know for sure how much delay there is, right? So 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 so, so I don't I. I it does. So so. So, so I would love to have more detailed conversations about exactly how how that works. Cause, you know, there's there's a lot. I think I have the general impression there's a lot we still don't understand about how black holes are formed, how long it takes them to really merge, and um, and what's out there. And we 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 don't have a very rich set of uh, models that we that we usually go to when we're doing these kind of studies of what we might learn with Lisa or something. Yeah. So. What is included in those simulations for sure in a proper uh, way? Do you, do you, why don't you say what the tracks are since we're talking the about them now? The tracks are basically mass fresh evolution of the center of the hole of selected levels, basically. So you start with a seed from the top left. So, so yeah, so here's you start you start with a large seed and you end up Excellent. with a large black hole at redshift to six. Or you start with a small seed and you end up with a large black hole by redshift to six. And all the, the, and the dots are <coughs> mergers. mergers, yeah. And so doing that basically the, the time of the merger includes for sure uh, uh, reliable say, uh, estimation of the dynamic of friction okay, which is Giga years at redshift zero, but it scales with really one plus three to the three and minus three over two. So it's much shorter at that redshift. Okay. Because the universe is dense. Small. That's right. But it's not the hardening. The hardening. The hardening in some models is included through no, some simple. No, if you ask me which line does and which does. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but you must have made two assumptions. One is how the dark matter halos are seeded. And the relationship of the halo to the black hole. But what did you assume? But that doesn't that doesn't have anything to do with the scale. So, yeah. so I I I the depends on the relative total mass of the system. The dynamic friction time scale the dynamic friction time scale depends on the properties of the galaxy. So the dynamic friction time scale is the I think scale of the halos. So I, a black hole in the uh, no, no, that's that's the I I would I I I I'm glad to to stimulate this discussion, but this is only one of my slides. <laughs> and I think we should have a splinter session on this topic. I was I was hoping to stimulate that. Okay, so. Yeah. All right, so go, go, go ahead. So this is not well, I'll put up another slide we can start arguing about. It's an illustration that it was not just the gravitational field, matter, matter. <laughs> Sorry? This is... Yes. Uh, that, that's coming up ahead here. So, so, so let, me, let me now... Um, we'll throw this into the same splinter session where we talk about um, what we can actually learn from gravitational wave observations. So these are comparing some the, the few sets of, of possible population models and what type of measurements you can make about them. Um, so now I want to move on to part two here, which is electromagnetic signals from black hole mergers. Let's see if I have any time left. Oh, no? Okay. Um, so, so just, just um, a uh, you know, some 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 rough thinking on this. So, so here's a, here's a, you have this giant amount of energy coming out in form of gravitational waves. So we imagine that there's some process whereby you know some of that energy somehow leaks into an electromagnetic signal. So you can kind of uh, make up something. So if you had Two percent of you started out with a, you know some some black hole and two percent of its mass gets converted into gravitational waves. You take a millionth of that and you convert it into electromagnetic signal somehow. You, then you're still left with 10 to the 52 ergs. So it's for for a 10 to the six solar mass black hole. So it, it's a lot of energy. And then, but then you have the question of how much time does it take for this? energy to get somehow reprocessed into an electromagnetic signal um, and come out. And so the gravitational wave time scale is very short, but then you know, it depends on what happens and how you generate an electromagnetic signal to get the real time scale, which is likely to be uh, at le you know, least as long and probably 
possibly much longer. And so um, I mean, exactly what the result is is unclear. Potentially very large, potentially very short-lived, um, but not clear. So um, said all that. Um, if you want to be able to observe it, it has to be sufficiently bright, um, but it also has to be distinct from other electromagnetic signals, right? So it can't just be something, you know, there was a, there was a warm glow over there and, uh, you know, it looked like any other warm glow that, uh, that might have been happening in a galaxy at any moment. But uh, um, the, so, so that's, you know, in, in terms of questions for simulations, in order to understand this, is there some kind of electromagnetic bomb? And I don't think I invented that description here, but anyway, it's useful. And is the flash from the bomb somehow distinct than other bombs? Because there's lots of electromagnetic bombs in the, in the, in the sky. Um, so here's uh, my one slide, which is an extended one slide on this um, simulation. So there's a whole bunch of different physics you want to add in to do these kind of simulations. So gravity you can start with. You can just talk about what are the trajectories of particles and did the particles slam into each other. And the first simulations there suggested you know, there might be something interesting happening. And then you can do um, gravity, which is hydrodynamic fluids, and look what happens to, to the fluids. And, the, and simulations in this uh, regard suggest you know, potential for electromagnetic uh, periodicities in a signal um, leading up to merger. Um, or instead of that, you could just have electromagnetic um, force-free hydrodynamics, uh, force-free magnetohydrodynamics, where, where you assume that the, that, the, that, the, that the gas is so tenuous that it doesn't have any hydrodynamic pressure at all. And then you have a Blanford's Nyack-like mechanism that suggests you can have these dual jet pictures and things on the way to merger. Or maybe it's important, probably, most likely, it's important to put, up, put those effects together and look at... Uh, at hydrodynamic uh, GRMHD, where you have gravity, magnetism, electromagnetism, and hydrodynamics all together. And um, uh, you know, first simulations here uh, you know, indicate the effect that you can get the a strengthening of the magnetic field through the hydrodynamic flows in the gravity, strong gravity dynamics leading up to merger. And since a lot of electromagnetic emission mechanism proportional to magnetic field squared, that leads you to stronger signals. Um, but to really understand these, you really have to look at the radiation coming out, and you have to look at how the radiation is processed and how it's related to the, to the signal. So there's been um, kind of little nothing done on this. So this is another GRMHD simulation that's been done. And all, it doesn't really include radiation, but it does include at least effective cooling from the radiation. And shows, not surprisingly, that the cooling is important um, in the dynamics in, of, the, of the circumbinary disk at the, in the vicinity time of merger. Um, uh, Jeremy uh, Schnittman has uh, taken one of our simulations of this and, you know, done a course. He has a code for, uh, uh, started out for just doing accretion disk uh, emission studies. And without really taking into account the fact that we had Two black holes, face time, we can run the code where we just sort of superpose the, the fluids on, on his space time structure of a curved black hole. Um, but the, the, it's, it's enough to kind of see the potential process that you get synchrotron emissions uh, coming out that get, were then seeming to be the potentially inverse content scattered up to a broadband signal there peaking in the X ray. Um, so just having the potential that there's a mechanism for giving x-rays, I think, is interesting because those would be easier to distinguish from, from uh, other, other stuff in the sky. And so another issue um, that I didn't mention here yet is that you know, in order to do this, it depends a lot on the details. And one of the important details is what you start with at the beginning of the simulation. You can only do a short simulation if you put in all this, this physics. And, and so there you really want to evolve a circumbinary disk for a longer period of time. And there's a GRMHD circumbinary disk simulations that, uh, that Scott's been doing. And this is really not the right place to, to stick them in here, because they're also looking at signals that come out um, in the precursory parts. Um, but um, there's, there's a whole lot to be done there. Um, so that was a very quick uh, whirl through of that. Um, and now I'm probably running out of time. Oh, no, I'm doing OK. OK. so. Um, so let's just put. 
I, I, maybe I should slow down and let other people digest and see if they had any questions. Did anybody have any questions? I, I could go. I for like a whole bunch of people in the room's work over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what do you think? Uh, I mean, what do you think the I mean, you the whole slide there with things. What do you think is the best, uh, like most promising way to couple the VR? Well, the mechanism for coupling the, the putting the formulating a GRMA problem is pretty clear, and you know we can do that. There's a couple of groups that have done that now for this problem. Um, the but that's not enough to to really say something terribly interesting because I think you really do need to know it's likely that your that the real problem is optically thick. And if it's optically thick, then certainly we're, we're, we're not necessarily very close yet without really taking radiation transport into serious accounts. And we're probably a few years away from really being able to do that. But yeah, a slightly more general question. Since the input, energy input is a very short effective time scale, do you have any idea of sort of what the reprocessing time or reverberation times are? Do they broaden things out by Factors of two or factors of a thousand? I, like some range. You mean the burst? Yeah. How does the burst the burst? Yeah, in other words, we're involving something with something else, but if it still keeps the short character, that allows you to recognize it. The, 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 the transmission of the gravitational wave burst through this has negligible disability effects. So, you know, a lot of the gas will wobble around a little bit. Yeah. Compared to the level of turbulence expected in this, right? Wow. That, that, that type of the. Uh, because there's very poor coupling, and these are very long wavelength modes. So it's like a surfer riding on a yeah. metal wave. Right. So it's not really. Maybe maybe I misled you a little bit. That well, but a tenth of the minus well, six, maybe there's, a, there's <laughs> a significant mass loss effect, right? As you said, that there's, there's a few percent to tens of percent of mass loss in the system, and then the gas will respond to that. Because that, that mass loss effect... Yeah, I, 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 I probably should have, have uh, included a slide that I threw out here. Um, that there are a number of mechanisms. So we're sort of looking at this instantaneous mechanism for generating a signal in the direct vicinity of the merging black holes in, 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 in fluids there. Um, but the effects of the merger on the disk environment and because the because it suddenly changes, that can give you signals that may persist over over a longer a longer period of time. And the ten to the minus six scaling comes from. I, the, 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 the I thought a millionth sounded plausible. Well, no, <laughs> the number would be people believe that uh, some gamma bursts or neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers, and those indeed have ten to the minus. 10 to 52 words isotropic corrected, but that's, that's mass of 10, not 10 to the 6. Yeah, that would be disrupted and stuff. So the baryon is doing it. The thing it, it, with the neutron star merger, you have a ready source of, of dense matter that you can draw in for electromagnetic signal. We don't really know if for what we have here. I do I do have this slide now, um, appropriately, which is designed to stimulate this kind of discussion. So, um, I just made up, you know, an hour ago, um, some scenarios here that that you might want to think about here. So you could have. Um, possibilities where there's little or no gas. Of course, the trivial one is there's no gas whatsoever and there is no electromagnetic signal. That's that's very clear, right? Um, the, or you could have some very tenuous gas and there might be a weak signal. You know, This would be purely optically thin. The signal would, would necessarily be short-lived. Um, uh, you would probably get some kind of broadband spectrum. It would be a very, you know, the, the, uh, Actually, I don't know what you get out of that spectrum. Um, or you could have, you know, at the other extreme, a really dense, you know, strongly optical thick um, cloud of gas around, and all you get out is some kind of thermal, heavily reprocessed, slowly decaying um, signal over a longer time scale, and it doesn't really distinguish itself from any other infrared signal in the galaxy that you're looking at. It looks just like some kind of star forming region, or not even this, you know, like a pile of stars, whatever. And um, um, that would be, you know, there's an intermediate region that's probably the sweet 
spot where you hope to where you hope to get some interesting signals from. So, on the other hand, you can consider how are you going to try to observe these. And the first question is if this is a multi-messenger situation and you have a gravitational wave observation, you might have some information about where it is in the sky. Rough information, maybe. You might have that information in advance, or you might be looking for the in your archival data, because that's the only kind of data you have, maybe, whatever it is, and you're trying to, 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 to do these without the benefit of gravitational waves. Yeah, you look like you're going to say something. No, okay. I have a simple uh, question. So yeah. When, when the metric occurs and there's gas over there, what is happening to it? What, what, what is the, so we're talking about compressing the gas, shocking the gas, as simple as this, or what? What do the simulations show in the GR and So, so the shocking the gas doesn't so, so seem to be it, it, it's really um, I think the the big question is what happens with the magnetic field I to, you know you, you might disagree but if if you know many if you're if, well there's that there are shocks that you get from changing the mass and things like that. There are shocks that you get from the from the from the motion approaching approaching the merger and maybe we get some precursory signals related to to, to something like this. Actually most of the light that we see from our simulation is due to shocks that pile up from the binary torque that slide into this orbiting plot that runs in the Orbiting the over-density of gas. Um, so this is far from the No, this is, uh, so our disks follow the binary, so there's enough stress yes. to, um, to follow the binaries down to the end. Nearly, yeah, like uh, down to, yeah. So the, the, we've done simulations where, you know, we're not seeing shocking effects so much as just a height, a strengthening, a, a strong strengthening in the magnetic field at the at the last moments of merger. The, the magnetic, increasing the flux in, in increasing all the the magnetically derived uh, like synchrotron. The shocking might depend also on how extended is the orbit. Oh, certainly. Yeah, it's it's, well, it's, it's is likely to be important in, in those pre mergers if, if it's large enough, though. Because. By this time, So um, I propose another splinter group for for this topic, and I'm particularly be interested to have you know discussion of this observational side of the question. So I, you know, I just threw up some scenarios over there. Where you, you know, you might think about sort of infrared optical sort of signals, which, or you might think about X-rays. Personally, those sound more promising, just because I'm really scared about the idea of having to actually distinguish the signal from something else, and that seems like it's. Uh, less to compete with in, in the X-ray world if you actually have something there. But then you have problems of, eh, we're trying to look at deep extragalactic stuff. We may not have very many photons to pick from. Um, so there's a lot of challenges if you're really going to try to observe these things. Um, room for good ideas. So now this is the final slide. Um, same slide I had before, because they grayed out some of the things which I have given you information about. It's not very much. There's still a lot today that, that, uh, that we don't know about. So I think this leaves us with what are the sort of current big questions um, in this general area. Um, and these are, you know, for, for me, some of these questions are, are really current and important because the next couple of years of the gravitational waves the, is when Europe is going to be making its decision as to what it wants to do, what it wants to do in the 
the 2020 to 2030 decade. And so we, it, we really would benefit from having a clear understanding of what the relation to gravitational waves and overall astronomy, gravitational wave observation and overall astronomy really is. And so I think that's the big, the big question and stuff that contributes to that is, uh, is important. So leave it there. So, like running uh, simulations of our large parameter space, you said we, there is no chance we can run you know, the simulation to cover the parameter space mass ratio of any space. If it's nine dimensional parameter space? So, okay, no, fair enough. So, is there some sort of uh, agreement of where the groups are going to concentrate the effort? Um, the, the so, there is a team, uh, there's a, a, a worldwide effort. Um, and a paper that's just been posted to archive. Sure. Um, there were a lot of people got together, tried to divide up doing simulations, and, and are using this in order to better um, better generate uh, empirical models for the waveforms. Because most, I guess that's the that's the main strategy, right? Is to try to generate empirical models that are good enough for doing your observations. Now, you might consider the possibility that that uh, if you actually have a specific observation and you're not confident that your empirical model is perfect enough to get you every last bit, you know, maybe you have high SNR, maybe you think you measured the mass to, you know, within 0.1% and you want to make sure that you didn't fool yourself and it's, not, you know, not really 4.1%. 2.5, not 4.26 times 10 to the 6 solar masses, or whatever, then um, maybe maybe there would be a reason for taking that specific case and then doing a targeted set of numerical simulations in order to make sure you really understand that little bit of the parameter space well. Um, and then you could tune the models to make sure they're accurate there. Um, but that would be the kind of approach I imagine you take, rather than hoping that you have the parameter, you know, a, a, an accurate understanding of the entire parameter space in the, in the finest degree. But that's so, <coughs> people are trying to. Oh, people have. have um, it, it varies, you know, broadly. But there, there are large simulations. You know, let's let's say the, you know, a hundred thousand to a million CPU hours. It really depends. Yeah. Could be less, but could be more. It's probably not. It turns out to be a really hands-on problem. Um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the Caltech Cornell people, they, they, they have to do a lot of work, as I understand, in order to get their simulations to really be ready to go. Um, anybody, you, you always have to be sort of monitoring and making sure. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a black box, press the button and run kind of thing. It's a, Why is that? Why is that? I, I, I don't have a great answer. To some degree, sometimes it is, but the thing is, um, there can be problems, and problems like your grid structure didn't turn out to be right for the problem, or you know your numerical code recently got changed because you work with a community of coders and it find out that it no longer actually works. Or is it just a very finicky problem? Huh? Is it we, uh, it's a we have bugs that we can full fix over time, or is this a the problem that is very ill-defined? I mean, so there are always frontiers that are that are challenges still, and I I, I didn't mention I, I had a, a few things mentioned, but you know most all but like three simulations where with spins less than 0.935, where where uh, we have to do go to a different family of initial data models, for example, to to get beyond that. Or you know, if you want to do these really long-lasting simulations, then then uh, you know you've got different challenges. And every time you do something that has a little different structure, you know, running longer, having higher spins, high, more rapidly spinning black holes are smaller, and so you want to you know structure your grids or your co-location points in the spectral case a little differently. Everything is a little is kind of unique, and so we 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 make one simulation off of a model of something similar, but we don't have you know, totally generic um, approaches to this. And I, I'm kind of surprised that it still seems to be as time-consuming as it is, but uh, 
Um, so some people do better than I do, but uh, yeah. I usually run on a few hundred processors. People have done like, examples where they run on a few thousand and show good scaling, but I think there they've turned off everything interesting about the simulation. So. <laughs> If you're doing something like it, so people, I, I know people have talked about doing some sort of brute force set of simulations, but but realistically, I don't think we we need quite that kind of thing right now. But, but for example, for a given mass pressure, I mean, or several spin. I mean, I think you want to have a lot of simulations. I think we could use maybe maybe we do need we we, we do need more of that. Well, we need we need to get a, a rich enough sampling of parameter space. Um, so that we can tune the EOB or, or other models. Um, and that's the effort that the NRAR group is trying to orchestrate. Um, so just, just to follow that up, how does error in the template, not error in the knowledge of the template, change the coded signals to noise that has been used? And was I, I'm making the assumption that the simulations <coughs> had perfect knowledge of the template. But that's not true, as you just told them. Right. So as you have ignorance, some level of ignorance, how does it change the effective signal to noise? So the effective signal to noise hopefully doesn't change very much. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a, a figure of merit, say, for for the ground-based stuff that they like to have 97 percent. All the signal to noise ratio comes from the inspire that we model at 1420 level. Okay. So even so, and that we control it. Huh? What do you mean control? Meaning that these are filler expansion in B over C that are now known to the you know seventh so, power. So, so some of the so it depends on the mass of the system. So the signal to noise is dominated by the integration on long time scales where the strong GR effect is not dominant. Uh, depends on the mass. That's, but but yeah, broadly okay. That, that's true for for the neutron star mergers. For sure, which is what, or which is what the, the main source for, for LIGO. It's also true for, you know, it's sort of conventional, you know, five solar mass black holes. Anything in that 10, 10 solar mass range, the merger is 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 happening a little too high for the, the sensitivity for band. Your it's it's months of the spiral, the spiral before you yeah. have the frequency the of merger. So, so the, all the signal to noise ratio is coming. Yeah? Well, uh, unless you find uh, down here more. Masses, uh, to to the that one? From the, uh, the, 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 the little cuts. But, but, but you didn't say yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. You're saying but the end spiral. Did I pass it? No. So. If it's sufficiently the most low level of D over yeah. two. Oh, 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 I saw it. Exactly. Exactly. So, of course, if you have a 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole at Redshift several, and therefore you just see the very final few orbits, then of course you rely entirely on the numerical relativity simulation. However, what saves you there is that you do not integrate for as many wave cycles. Yeah? Okay, you want to make an arrow which is smaller than half a wave cycle, and therefore there is a trade off. I think for for um I think for detection we are in a pretty good shape. For very exquisite parameter estimation is a completely different story. And you know, yeah, we may so. be biased by systematic numerical errors or <coughs> you know. Yeah, people even talk about, you know, are are we biased by uh, by assuming that GR is right, and there could be another theory that's. But if you're worried about uh, model depend, if you if you're worried about model dependence in the third significant digit of the mass of the black hole, you know, then. That's <laughs> Don't forget one significant digit. <laughs> I mean, the, the, okay, people want to do long numerical samples not just because they want to waste. Because they want to match the numerical solution to the Newton expansion in the regime of value the Newton expansion. Of course. So, so for there, the match is the match is good. To there is a one percent uh, offset or something there. And since then, you 
This is then you resolve the numerical constant equation with some energy conservation constraint and see why the similar position form. So you might you might get the one percent wrong as an R because you know by matching your thing to signal but that's it. You're not screwing up fifty percent of the signal. Right. Well, so usually you don't care about if you lost 1% of your SNR, but if your SNR is marked in the ground, this is really important, right? Because if you if you lose even you know a few percent, then then you potentially lose a number of your significant first objects to observe. So you don't want that to happen. But uh, um, and and for the ground-based cases, the majority of sources you expect are like this bottom one, where the merger happens. Like Alberto was talking about, where the merger is not not near the sensitive part of the band. So if, if the merger is not near the sensitive part of the band, the numerical relativity part is not as crucial. But for so for ground based, it means if you have black hole mergers with 50 solar mass black holes, sort of intermediate scale, then you'd be really worried about the numerical relativity. But we're not as worried about observing those either. So, but there, I mean, the problem there is that you integrate for many thousands of cycles in the spiral. And then, of course, your wavelength is very sensitive to the post newtonian order that you're using your expansion. So you might not have the analytical the, the correct thing. I mean, if you, if you... If you don't get too close to the merger, the post newtonians should agree right, with each so other. Right, 3 p.m. and 3.5 p.m. You know, the, the phasing for one cycle into within thousands of cycles is pretty easy. I have a general question. So when you talk to middle schools and places like that, when do you have a, a good analogy where we are as far as science is concerned? So what was the other area of physics or maybe chemistry a century ago, 50, 50 years ago? Where some basic understanding about I don't ever give such an analogy, so... Um, <laughs> When I talk to, to kids, they just want to they just want to hear about black holes, you know. They love. Well, so let's move it to high school. But for the analogy that would work with us, where 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 are we? I mean, what, what is this? Where, who is we? Right? Because we're in different places for sure. <laughs> I, as a gravitation wave observer, have never seen data. But uh, um, <laughs> other fields, you know, have a different situation. So that's one you need. <laughs> well, I, I'm not in the LSC, so I've never seen data. So fake data. Yeah, I've seen fake data, right? But, but, but so, I mean, I think um, you, you can make an analogy between gravitational waves and sort of infantile uh, fields of astronomy in other ways. And I think that, uh, like, for now, I, I think one, you, you, if you imagine the first, the first sort of instruments we have, um, we're not going to know where the sources are coming from in the sky, really, they're kind of like um, just, we're just getting some, some signal and we, we, we won't, we will have a hard time getting information about it, but, um, you know, some of them we have good signal to noise ratio, it's a very unusual situation that we have very precise theory about what we're expecting. I, it's hard to think of anything like that. Maybe it's like the particle accelerator people in, yeah, in that like regard. But it's like the microwave background the year before. That could be. They had data. They had data, though. But I mean, no, wait a second. No, there was no detection of microwaves before. The there was no detection of the background. The flux, the flux was known. And we had Maxwell's equations that we knew worked. Well, well we know Einstein's equations worked. I mean, we don't know that. Mike, but you didn't go we do know Einstein's yeah. equations. Actually, actually, we have, yeah. we have, we have the observational basis for some of the gravitational waves yeah, in, in direct well, but, but we don't have. So I want to leave this room yeah. when I will see my family, uh, my daughter, and son, what we've been doing all day long, and I will tell them. <laughs> How, so if, if we are the people who are to fund this activity, okay, so. Years, I mean, what is, oh, please, you sound like a congressman. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So I mean, so no, this is this is so gravitational waves. It's it's um, we know that the universe is is you know dominated by gravitational forces on large scales, and we know there are a few hints of mysteries there. We think we have reason to explain exactly what happens when black holes merge. We think these. 
these mergers are happening. We have a totally different way to try to observe and get totally different kinds of information from that. We're trying to build telescopes that can do that, um, though unfortunately they're not cheap. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we'd like to really get this entirely orthogonal uh, view on what's going on in the universe. It's very, very quantitative and, uh, and very detailed, but, and, and potentially shows us things that we can't see any other way. So that's, the, that's where we are, trying, trying to open the, quote, new window on the universe. It's what's <laughs> 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 All right, so we're over time. We can keep discussing, but if people want to uh, wander off, they should feel like. <laughs>